How's it going, Lone Riders? Check out the Rackless Motorbags video three. So just a quick update for the guys that don't know, we make these pannier, panniers here, the soft, semi-rigid panniers, and they're quite popular. We At the moment, we have the quick release system that goes onto racks, and the racks are here, you can see, uh, it's got black racks and you just put the bag on, you lock it and you put, take the bag off whenever you want. Pretty practical. We're looking to go one step further and reduce weight and reduce complexity and actually remove the racks completely. So on the right here you see uh, our GS1250, the 40 year anniversary version with racks. These are OEM, BMW OEM racks. And on the left you see the same bike but the triple black version without racks. So our pannier system actually goes straight on to these OM out of the box, straight onto these racks, and we are developing a rackless system in the bottom left hand corner here. This was the first generation prototype. We actually built prototypes off this and we worked out a lot of things and updated a lot of uh, features. We updated the back plate from 4mm aluminium and now we are using HTPE or testing HTPE. It works great. It's lighter and it's more flexible. It gives more flex and crashes and stuff like this. So the stress is uh, distributed across the whole part and not into an individual part that actually breaks. So that's a real big bonus. Uh, and we also developed a offset kit here. So the motor bags fit straight onto the GS version of the BMW R1200 and 1250. Uh, that, that fits straight on. And it also works with an adapter that we've also been developing for the GS a the, the adventure version 1200 and the 1250 here you can see uh, this is our first round of prototype and what we did we designed for manufacture for this part and we got it to a, a point where we can test it what i did is i manufactured five sets of these and i sent them out around the world went to thailand a couple went to france uh, we sent to switzerland belgium and new zealand and guys tested them and they used them in their day-to-day -day life and gave me feedback. I'm going to show you this feedback now. This is how we test, or just part of how we test. Uh, and then we'll show you that we'll go through the process a little bit of how we actually, you know, develop this project. On the bottom left hand side, that's my bike there, and I've just finished the five sets. Um, here I'm spraying them black, uh, so that's so you can get kind of like an idea of what they look like at the end. Uh, we also made just silver ones, and that's because um, we don't really care, we're probably going to destroy them anyway. Um, there's no uh, the, uh, functional models, they're not like high-end uh, finished models. And on the right here, right hand side here, that's then lined up. It was a little manufacturing production that I had going uh, in our workshops and um, they were based off a previous design that we made just out of plastic. So we want to get to a solution as quickly as possible or we want to get to a result as fast as possible. And so the first round we actually made it just out of plastic and 3D printed parts. So the second round we got 100% full and metal parts just to test what really happens and when we're using them and also when we crash them and all this kind of stuff. So I tested this on my bike just for fitment and making sure it fits and also fitting the adapter kit also making sure that fits from the GSA so we can port over that functionality. It worked perfectly, it was really, I love them already, I'm in love with the system, it's so much faster and easier and simple and uh, just way more practical. You're on and off within a couple of seconds and you also, I don't even lock them. I don't even need to lock them. They clip in place and they're locked essentially already. Of course, if you want to lock them when you're in town or something like this, then yeah, you um, you can lock them, but essentially just for day-to-day -day use, you don't even need to lock them, which I find pretty cool. It's like really instant, it's super fast. Let's watch a couple of videos that I made uh, and um, Ted Fred, the founder of Lone Rider, he was also making a couple of vids. He's in Thailand and he's been testing it on his setup.
Check out this slow mo. This was from Fred and his bike. If you can see here, what we can like focus in on is what happens when the bike actually hits, you know, and then we can see exactly where the pressure points are and how the, all the material deforms under pressure. So you can see it here, we've got a quite a bit of pressure at the top. With that, we can reinforce it. And then there's more pressure again, so it hit that twice. So just in one fall, there was pressure put on that top, top line there, it released, and then it came back again. Nothing like a good slow mo. If you want to watch these videos, I'll leave the link in the description down below. So that was a couple of tests that we did and the results from that are, we realized that we're getting quite close to the muffler here. So we've got to watch out for that. It's not really a worry at this stage, but we just do have to think about it. Uh, some of the foot broke here, but it's kind of expected. We are using 3D printed 100 fill. So it's not completely perfect. Uh, it's not solid uh, plastic, injection molded plastic, which is far superior. But we know where it breaks now, which is important. You know, it shows us where the, the breakage will happen. Uh, and also um, the compression, we realized that there was a lot of movement and play in there. So we're gonna put some kind of rubber stoppers in there just to like fill it out so you don't get that, that, that rattling when you're riding. Also with some bikes, the indicator was different. So just to us that the BMW change uh, if randomly the uh, indicators in the rear. So they had the short version on the rear here. And our system was actually hitting that, and you can see here it got broken. Uh, the, the actual light got broken. So you can see on the right hand side here, we're off way too big uh, in the length direction here. We need to come back at least 25 mil or 30, 30 mil just to clear that out. And also a couple of comments we see here, um, people saying, yeah, it looks too bulky, it looks too bulky. So we do read these comments and we, we take that to heart and we do actually make uh, those updates. And so we did, um, we made the updates, we reduced it by quite a bit. Uh, we made it smaller, thinner and shorter as well, which was really good. So we did um, solve the problem with the, the size and also for the, 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 the indicator protector collision there. And um, we, so we, re, we used the same concept, but we just miniaturized it and refined it a lot more. Uh, we also used uh, Tom Barra, he's a French writer, Bit of a crazy one, so let's check out him. He's riding into trees. So you can see here how he was actually aiming for the tree, right? We're trying to we're trying to really uh, hit these bags as hard as we can, and we're talking uh, a pretty big bike here, moving at, at pace. And you can see how he turns in at the last minute just to really connect, which was, well, so the chances are this happened in real life is low or lower, but um, we wanted to see what happens if you actually, if you hit the bag with a tree, nothing survives a collision with a tree. And it stayed on, it stayed on. In this video, we we're testing the original quick release motor bags on racks. And what we found out is that it's super strong. It did not come off. It hit several times and it did not come off. We did really well with this. These are strong as. So we also tested this with the current rackless system. And yeah, it came off exactly how we expected to it because we're using much less points of attachment and this is how it's designed. So what we wanted is that it just pops off and stops the damage to the, the bag and the bike and the subframe like that. Um, what we found out is most importantly is where it broke and how we can reinforce it or we can actually weaken it so we can break things in the right places. So if we can, if you hit a tree, which I hope you don't, I seriously hope you don't have to hit a tree, but if you do and it breaks, we can replace that part and just send you that part and it doesn't, uh, all that stress and that, that pressure doesn't get absorbed throughout other parts of the bag and destroys parts that we can't replace. So that's Tom, that's Tom Barrett. Go and check out his uh, site. He's French speaking, but he makes pretty cool videos. Um, like riding off cliffs and stuff like this. Hardcore rider on a big, big GS. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. Check him out. He's our rider that basically destroys 
all my gear. I love him and I hate him at the same time. Everything I make, he destroys. So if, if he can't destroy it, basically, or if he can destroy it, but it takes him a while, then it's definitely, definitely good. It's definitely good. Uh, he ends up destroying everything, I should say, anyway. But, you know, uh, it's a really good test because it's on the ultra, ultra extreme side of riding and ultra extreme side of the crash testing. And he puts his, he trains a lot of uh, riders down in southern France and they ride all day, every day through crazy rocky terrain and all over the show. So uh, yeah, it's a really good idea, an indicator of how good the products are, how they, good they are designed and manufactured. The materials we use, the, the way we stitch it all together, the way we produce them basically. So go check him out. He's in the link in the description down below for Tom Barrett and uh, give him a follow. What we found out by hitting trees was uh, we've got to release the pressure on this connection point uh, here so then you can actually open it because what it did is it actually clamped it close so it's okay to write right off um, that's what we want to do we want to be able to continue the trip right we want to uh, jimmy it back together so we can continue the trip you don't want to be stuck in the middle of nowhere with a bag and a hand, riding home with a bag in a hand so um, this is what we're trying to save you from and we found out where everything broke and we found out that here you can see on the right side that actually snapped off so we can reinforce that or we can make it weaker depending on which angle we go for if we go for weaker that means it'll come off nicely and won't damage itself or any other parts but if we reinforce it then uh, it could damage the bike or damage more other parts so we've got to try and find a nice balance between the two uh, and then we also found out that the, the closing mechanism there was a bit um, damaged from the whole thing but great, we found out that um, these parts bend and it's harder to open. So what we're gonna do is introduce some cuts, uh, some slight cuts. So if it does start bending, um, it's kind of sheared. So only one part bends and the other one stays solid straight. That's how we're gonna solve that one. We also looked into putting, there's a lot of comments about putting a toolbox in there. And what we've found is that there's not enough room. It looks like there's room, but since we've actually made it smaller already and made it more compact and um, lighter, uh, there's no, not much room inside there and also there's a lot of metal parts and moving parts in there so if you did put a bag and then a woodproof bag or something it's just going to get ripped up anyway so we're not going to do that we did try it we actually designed one as you can see here we did test it very simple system um, but at this stage it's it's not going to be in the final product it is no need uh, at this stage and also what we could also do is have another way and have kind of like a bracket underneath this a separate part that we can screw on there uh, and that'll, be, that'll function much much better than having it all in here inside here because we can't get it waterproof in there uh, we can't get it dust proof we can't get it uh, sharp edge proof or anything like that so um, we are going we tried it it didn't work we're going to try and find another solution some other way for the foot for the foot area i told you before we found out where things break and when we find out where things break we can reinforce them or make them weaker but we're going to reinforce this part because we don't want it to break uh, because it has no carry-on effect to any other parts. So what we're going to do is what we can do is we can find out these angles here and make them uh, better angles. Uh, with angles we can strengthen parts and uh, we can increase the wall thickness of this plastic part here and we can also over mold which means uh, just think of a toothbrush you've got the soft rubbery parts and then you've got the, the plastic hard plastic parts that's called over molding. So what we can do is we can over mold plastic or steel inside the plastic. We do that with our hooks already. We do that with a couple of parts already just to strengthen them. That's another thing that we can do. We can really, really make it super strong by adding these metal parts in there. Another thing that we've been testing is the back plate. So we're going to use HDPE, which is kind of like a very, very common material plastic. Think of kayaks, kayaks of HDPE, and also those big water tanks that you see on farms and things like that, those huge rotationally molded things. That's HDPE. The reason why it's so good is because it's super durable and it's super strong. But we've been testing this and they work great. Uh, there's a few small things that we have to look into um, and adjust, but yeah, we're good to go and we'll probably upgrade this across the whole design range. As you, if you can see in the top left hand corner here, this was a client, he um, obviously had an accident or some kind of uh, fall off and it bent the plate. And this takes a lot of pressure to do this. Uh, that's, a big, that's a big one. Uh, so hopefully with the new HDB back plate, it'll take that hit, it'll take that pressure and bend out and then it'll come back and, and line itself and yeah, be good to go. So at this stage, uh, this, this, this rider probably couldn't continue riding without bending that back, which is possible, but 
Um, I'm not sure. Uh, but with the HCPE plate, what we can do is it, just, it probably would have bent out and then bent back into place by itself. Always improving. So we're going to do uh, DFX, which is designed for excellence. And that's kind of like a flash way of saying basically make product uh, awesome in all different aspects of the supply chain. Which means uh, we can start right from design for manufacturers, which is DFM. That's what we're doing now. And I'll show you what that means in a minute. We're going to design for assembly as well, which is also very important. So how we assemble it. It takes time to put this stuff together. There's actually a human there, right, screwing in and putting them all together. So we're going to stop him or her from making mistakes. We use Pokioka, which is you can only put parts in a certain way. You can only put certain screws in certain ways. Uh, all this kind of stuff. It's it's a it's a very it's an art, and it's um, we want to remove the human uh, fail point, the just machine fail point, right? We can uh, design for reliability, that's what I mean with updating the backplate to HDPE. Quality, naturally, that's the supply selection. Maintenance, we want to send you spare parts. And as, as I said before, we want to break parts where we want to break parts so we can supply those parts to replace or you can carry on writing. Uh, design for testing, I mean, we test them already, but we, we this is not so um, important. Design for supply chain. So basically we're making it smaller, we're making it lighter, it's going to be lighter to ship. Uh, design. For cost, yeah, cost as well. We've, I'll show you that in a minute. What we've done to improve that, but this is what we're doing now. This is what I'm going to say. We, this is where we are at the moment. We've got the concept. We've got great feedback from everybody. We've got the um, working prototypes that have been tested, and now we're going into this kind of this, this stuff that no one sees. What is design for manufacture? It's a lot of things, but on the base level, it's designing a part where it's easy to manufacture. Uh, it doesn't cost too much to manufacture because if you quantify those parts out, they start adding up and then the end consumer will be out of their price range. So you've got to like reduce the parts or make the parts the same inside one piece or one product. So if you look on the left here, this, this is the start and this on the right side is the finish. You can see here, this is basically just the volume, what we need. We need this thickness, we need holes here, we need holes here. That's that's it, that's all we need. And then if you go into the next one, the green one here, this is basically the same thing. But what we've done is we've designed it for manufacture. So here you can see that we've opened up a place for bolts, we've added in polka things so things can only go in one way, and we've reduced the material so the machines can actually injection mold this. I can actually see here there's a little bit of a, an error, but that's because we're still developing this part. So that's the difference. That's just design and making it work. And on the other side here is design for manufacture. For example, down here you can see we need to put draft angles on everything because when you've got two, uh, for example, for injection molding, you've got two parts coming together. When you pull them apart, there's, there's air behind here. And if you, if if you can't let air in, it's going to be very hard to pull this out. So we, we put angles on them. So if it removes a little bit, it can get in there and the part can pop off easy. Or the parts don't stick to the sidewalls. And that is basically designed for manufacture. So what we've done since the last video uh, and testing, as you've seen, is Rackless version one, the DFM round one. This was 3.4 kilos per unit and had 95 parts. This one where we are right today. Today we are at Rackless V2, which is the DFM round two, and we are down 500 grams, half a kilo, and we're down almost half parts as well. So our results is minus 14% for the weight, which is really critical on a bike. So you can times that by two, right? Um, left and right. Uh, we've got a set of motor bags there. And then the parts is minus 40%. That's just huge. It's huge for us because we don't have many parts to manufacture or look after. And it's huge for you because it's cheaper for you guys and it's easier to manage or replace parts and all this kind of stuff. So, And also, um, in total, we're looking at a, a re reduction of 84 parts in total and a kilo, which is massive. That all that decreases the manufacturing costs and, of course, what the end product and the assembly costs and also the shipping costs. So that's it this week for this video. Do make sure you click that subscribe, like, and little bell icon to get notifications. In the description down below, we have lots of uh, links to what I was talking about today, the videos, 
and also um, the email that we send out weekly about these videos and other information so about the industry so do sign up if you're not signed up already and i'll catch you next week